matches. Aha! Sometimes being a scientist is like this. You can't always see what you're talking about. Take atoms, for example. In this match head alone, there are millions of them. But of course, we can't see them. So how do scientists get around this? Ow! They use models. Scientific models. Scientific models have been used to understand most of the things we take for granted. Travelling on the train, striking a match, forecasting the weather, everlasting diamonds, and flying an aircraft. Clear prop. Now, I'm very confident of my ability uh, to fly this plane. Are you, Suki? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm confident because scientists have put aircraft like this through loads of rigorous tests. They've made small scientific models of the aircraft and tested it under all kinds of extreme conditions, which uh, we hope never to encounter. What do you say to that? Well, hopefully not, but with your flying. Who knows? Thank you. When new aircraft types are designed, scientists make models of them and put them through all kinds of stringent scientific tests. They want to see how the air flows over the wings, how it reacts to turbulence, or even how it takes off and lands, and the best angles at which to fly it, the angles of attack for the wings. Concorde started its life like this, a triangular piece of metal in a water tank. The green bands simulate airflow. Models are linked to computers, which measure and display data about their performance. Models are an essential part of science. They help us to understand how things work and what will happen in certain situations. Take the weather, for example. As a pilot, you've got to know what the weather's going to do, and computer models of the weather help us know this. We're approaching our uh, landing circuit. Just look at this place. There are enough aircraft in here to keep even the most enthusiastic pilot happy for a week. But I tell you what, this hangar is also good to demonstrate something else about science. If we want answers to scientific questions, scientific models come in very handy. Questions like, what happens in a chemical reaction? Lighting that match is a chemical reaction. Here's another one, using the match to light the burner. Another question is, what happens when a solid changes shape. Little planes made of lead. And as you can see, as it's heating with my burner, a physical change taking place, it's gradually becoming liquid. But of course, it's still lead. Even though the solid has become liquid, it's still lead. And here's another question. What happens when liquid becomes gas? Steam's rising up, the liquid has now become gas. All these questions can be answered using a scientific model. But I guess the next question is, what does one of those look like? Well, the best way to illustrate it is with the simplest of all atoms, the hydrogen atom. And I'm going to do a scientific model of the atom for you. In the centre there is a big blob, that's the nucleus, inside which is the positively charged proton. And buzzing around the outside, we've got the single negatively charged electron. But how do scientists know this if they can't see it? Suki! Right then, what have you got for me? It's a hood. Brilliant. What's it used for? It's used for practicing instrument flying when you can't see out the window. So when, I, when the pilots put this on to practice, they can't see anything out the window, just their instruments. No. Just what I need, because I'm now going to demonstrate how scientists can determine what something is without actually seeing it. So you can bring on the first object. Right then. Here's your first one. I'm ready and waiting. What is this? It's intriguing. Ooh, the knobbly bit there. Oh, hang on. I think I've got it. It's a steering yoke. That's right. One down, two to go. Bring on the next one, please, Suki. What's the next one going to be? Let's see. Oh, my goodness. What's this? Um, is it... Is it a, something with a flying stick or something, is it? I have no idea. What is it? It's the pedals from oh. the floor. All right, that's not so good. Uh, the third one. Make it. Make this one easy one, Suki. I've got to look good. I've got to look okay. talking about. What's this? It sounds good. It's a uh, box with ball bearings in it. That's okay. right. Is that right? That is right. Excellent. There you go. That's two out of three, which I guess proves that scientists can determine what something is without actually seeing it. Where have you gone? 
Suki? When scientists work with atoms, it's a bit like me and my blindfold test. Instead of touch and sound, they carry out indirect experiments to get information about atoms and make models of them. Now then, in the flying school, before I do anything else, it's important to work out where I'm going. And the way I do that is with an aeronautical map. Uh, this map, as you know, is not a photograph. It's much more like a scientific model. In that way, it's similar to the model of an atom. Take the helium atom, for example. In the middle there, you've got the nucleus. And in the nucleus, you've got two protons. They're positive. You've got two neutrons holding the, the uh, protons together. Then buzzing around the outside, you've got two negative electrons. You see, this model is not a photograph. It's not even a drawing taken from a photograph. It's much more like my aeronautical map. And with that in mind, where is Oxford Circus? Come on, then, let's go. Quick as you like. Excuse me. Uh, single to Oxford Circus, please. 140 smashing. They are, bud. Lovely. Now then, Oxford Circus, where are we? Now then. This is interesting, you see. The London Underground Tube Map is very similar to scientific models because uh, it looks nothing like the real thing. You see, the lines aren't straight like this in real life. They're certainly not black, uh, yellow and red, are they? Uh, the important thing is that you can easily understand where you're going. You can get from A to B. And for me, A is St John's Wood, and B is Oxford Circus. Now, I've got two possible routes from St John's Wood to Baker Street on the Grey Jubilee line, uh, and change there onto the Brown Baker Loo line to lovely old Oxford Circus. Or, if that doesn't tickle your fancy, uh, you can go from St John's Wood to Bond Street on the Grey Jubilee line and change there onto the Red Line, which, as everyone knows, is a central line. Well, I reckon the second one's my favourite. Bond Street, here I come. Thousands and thousands of people use this model every day, and it rarely fails to work. Now, of course, I need my map again, which acts like my uh, scientific model, because it shows me exactly where I'm coming from, in this case, uh, St John's Wood, up to here, Bond Street. Um, but more importantly, it shows me where I'm going to, Oxford Circus, which means I need the central line. Let's go. Come on. Well, what is this uh, central line uh, we're we going to? Bond Street, Oxford Circus, here we are, this way. I don't know why I'm bothered running, actually. Scientific models are always changing, and that includes everything from models of atoms to models of the underground system. See, the great thing about scientific models is that they're like the London Underground map. They're constantly changing. It wasn't always like this, you know. But as it grew and became more co and complicated, they had to change the map to make it more understandable. Some of the early maps had the tube system superimposed on a street map of London, not very user-friendly. Later, they lost the street map, which made it clearer to follow, and then they totally redesigned it, so it became a really easy-to-use model, and it always does the job, even though it doesn't look like the real thing. In the same way, models of atoms have changed. This is one model, and this is another. The one you use depends on what you want to do with it. Just like if you're a passenger, the tube map is the best model. But if you're learning to be a train driver, this model is more useful. So, I've got to my destination using a model. Next stop, the snooker club. The ancient Greeks thought that all matter was made up of atoms, and that atoms were like solid balls. They stayed with this idea for about 2,000 years until some bright spark suggested there were two kinds of matter, some with a negative and some with a positive charge. About 90 years ago, scientists thought that atoms were like this. The red bit is the positive charge, and the little dots there are the negative charge, the electrons. So this model showed how the atom could have two kinds of matter. The red part of the ball was positive charge, and the silver dots were negative charge. 
but it was wrong. Around about 1910, a gang of scientists called Geiger, Rutherford and Marsden did an experiment in which they shot tiny alpha particles, those of a very small nuclei of uh, helium atoms, at a thin piece of gold foil in a vacuum. A little bit like uh, miniature bullets in an atomic shooting range. These are the helium nuclei, or alpha particles, being fired at the gold foil. They found that most of the particles went all the way through. A few changed direction, and a very small number actually bounced back. The scientists assumed that the atoms in the gold foil were laid out a bit like the red balls on the snooker table. So, this is how Rutherford changed the scientific model of the atom. With all this particle shooting going on, he worked out that it couldn't possibly be like the inside of my crack snooker ball. It was much more likely the inside of an atom was made up mainly of a great deal of empty space. The positive charge wasn't spread out like the red of my uh, snooker ball, but more likely concentrated in the centre. In other words, it had a central nucleus like this red snooker ball. And rather than my scattered silver dots, the negatively charged electrons were buzzing around the outside, like this little marble. That explains why, with all the atoms spread out in the gold foil, a little bit like the red balls on my table, it was able to fire those particles, and most of them went all the way through without touching anything. But occasionally, the particles, in other words, the helium nuclei, changed direction. In other words, they must have hit the other nuclei. And a small number of particles actually bounced back. The positive helium nuclei were repelled by the positive gold nuclei. So, how do we use this model, which has electrons and shells or rings going around a tiny central nucleus, to understand what happens when chemicals react? like sodium metal burning in chlorine to form sodium chloride. How can scientific models help us to understand chemical reactions? Well, I've got a dartboard and a great way of showing you. Oh, thanks very much. So here we go, sodium atom. <clears throat> there you go, that's two in the uh, first year. You go, that's eight in the second year. And that's one in the third shell. Let's go have a look. And there you have it. Two electrons in the first ring, eight in the second ring, and just one all on its own in the third ring. The important thing to remember about the sodium atom is that it only has one electron in its outer shell. And here goes chlorine. That's two in the first ring. That's eight in the second ring. Ah, oh, that's seven in the third ring. Let's go have a look. You see, it's a bit like the sodium atom. It's got two electrons on the first ring, it's got eight on the second, but this is where it's different. It's got seven electrons on the third ring. The fact that the chlorine atom has seven electrons in its outer shell is the key to understanding why sodium and chlorine react with each other. Now, chemists have found that the most unreactive of atoms seem to feature eight electrons on the outside ring. So when sodium reacts with chlorine, sodium gives its outer electron to the chlorine atom. Sodium ends up with eight electrons in what is now its outer shell. And chlorine also ends up with eight electrons in its outer shell. And both atoms are stable. And bingo, that's our model, helps us to understand chemical reactions. In nature, things aren't just made up of single atoms. Whatever we choose to study, it will be made up of billions and billions of atoms, even a small quantity of gas. What makes a solid a solid? This lead shoe is made up of billions and billions of lead atoms. The scientific model of a solid has all the atoms packed closely together. The atoms do not move around very much. They vibrate, but don't move around from A to B. It's a bit like tap dancers tapping on the spot, but without actually moving around on the dance floor. When solids like lead are heated, they melt. How does our scientific model explain how solids change to liquids? 
the energy from the flame causes the atoms to move faster. They move further apart and the metal structure collapses. It's as if the dancers tap faster and move around the floor. In the same way, when a solid changes to liquid, the particles move faster and begin to escape from each other. So what happens when a liquid like water is heated to become steam, a gas? Heating causes the particles to move faster and faster. Particles in a gas are much further apart than particles in a liquid. In our analogy, it's as if the dancers are moving furiously and as a result take over a much larger section of the dance floor. But in solids, the particles can pack together in different ways. They can pack together like this, where the third layer is identical to the first layer. Or like this, where all three layers are stacked differently. The way atoms stack can make an enormous difference to the properties of the solid. These diamonds are worth thousands of pounds. Apart from their beauty, diamonds are amongst the hardest substances known. Diamonds are a form of carbon made up of billions of carbon atoms. A graphite pencil worth about one pound is also made of carbon, but unlike diamond, it is black and slippery. Both diamond and graphite are made up of exactly the same atoms, but it's the way these atoms pack together that makes these substances so completely different. They have different structures. This is the model of the diamond structure. It's only a small section, since even in a very small diamond, there are billions of carbon atoms. Each carbon atom is joined to four others in a regular tetrahedral arrangement. This regular arrangement makes the structure difficult to break apart, which accounts for its hardness. This is a model of the graphite structure. It is made up of layers. Within each layer, each carbon atom is attached to three others by strong bonds. This forms a pattern of interlocking hexagonal rings. However, the bonds between the layers are weak and the layers are able to slide over one another like a pack of cards. This makes graphite soft and slippery. When we draw with a pencil, layers of graphite flake off and stick to the paper. Scientific models can help us understand the properties of solids, how one structure leads to one set of properties and another arrangement leads to a totally different set of properties. They can explain how solids change to liquids and liquids change to gases. And finally, models of atoms can help us understand chemical reactions. In chemistry, it's the outer electrons that play the vital role. <laughs>